Money in the bank, man. That was something. You got. Well, let's be clear here. The WWE needed it to be something. Perfect. It was not. A show that if you stuck through it to the end, you found enough things to enjoy and it left you with a strong last impression to the point where you said, this was a good show. Yes, it certainly had that. It certainly wasn't carried by the first two thirds of the show because it was admittedly kind of a mixed bag. Like, well, let me say this. Like, if I ever get a DUI, let me hope I fail upward like Jimmy Uso. I mean, what better way to send him a strong, strong message than to have him win the tag team championship belt on the pre-show? Let's all hope we can fail like that, huh? What the fuck? Even more so weird that this match was on the pre-show, but whatever, nonetheless. For the actual main card, it started off with an absolute raging, lousy dud. And if you agree, you should smash that subscribe button and follow the show on Twitter if you don't already. Twitter handle is in the description box below. This woman's money in the bank ladder match. I, I tweeted at the start of the show that I wish money in the bank was a mania match, not a pay-per-view concept anymore. And it's because of matches like this. Because they feel the need to put people in a match where they don't really belong. They feel the need to put a match in there that's not really called for. And you get a steaming pile of shit that was this. The ladies' performance was pathetic. Abysmal. It was clunky. It was off-paced. Like, just really bad. And then the finish... Whereas visually, I will give the company credit, like whoever the agent was for this match did a good job of constructing kind of a somewhat creative finish. You've got three ladders in, you've got six women on the ladders, and then Nikki Ash climbs up in between everybody to retrieve the briefcase. Like that in and of itself was well done. Having Nikki Ash win the Money in the Bank briefcase... Like, this felt really random. You know, and even when you look at the name of Nikki Ash, like, if she came up with this name on her own, it is a perfect reminder of why wrestlers don't always do good things when it comes to gimmicks. And if this was a WWE idea to give her this dumbass name, then, yeah, I don't even know what the hell to say. Um, yeah, just really weird. Like, obviously the crowd popped big for it, but they usually pop big for most Money in the Bank winners, let's be clear. So that's not something that automatically indicates that this was the right decision. Like, if you really truly look at this, like, sure, I could default and say I would have loved to have seen a Naomi win, or the way they were doing things somewhat recently, maybe it made sense to have a Liv Morgan win. But the reality is, is none of these ladies, frankly, at this point, were any more well positioned to be the Money in the Bank winner than the next. That's the reality. Like, even when I go back to this match, though, just thinking about it, even the very beginning, Alexa Bliss is standing up on the second turnbuckle, just standing there doing nothing. Why wouldn't anybody attack her? Like, that, that's fucking dumb. So the rest of this match, except for the actual execution and visuals of the finish, was garbage. And the decision of who to have win it, like, this superhero gimmick needs to get have people get behind it. Felt like way too forced, way too early to have her win Money in the Bank. You know, if it leads to her failing to cash in on Charlotte Flair, oh God, or Bianca Belair, then that's something. You can work with that. But otherwise, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. The next match, the Raw Tag Team Championship match, was infinitely better than the Women's Money in the Bank match, beyond question. AJ and Amos took on the Viking Raiders, defended their belt successfully. This match was very good. Like, this was a pay-per-view quality match, legitimately. And as far as Amos goes, like, you look at him and you say, that's somebody that you're grooming someday to take on the Romans of the world and the Lashleys of the world. He certainly is not there yet. Like, you even had some moments in this match where, on the one hand, he looked like a big deal. You're like, he's the Diesel and AJ's the freaking HBK. And that's a fair comparison. Like, you could go there with this. 
but some of the individual spots within the match where he had those moments where he looked like a kind of tall, imposing, dominant powerhouse. He had other moments where his selling was bad, his movement was clunky, he didn't really seem to know what he was doing. Like, he's got some work to do. If he can work to improve and make big improvements in some cases, you can be talking about a guy that could be a big deal for them in the future. Uh, but good tag team match for sure. And then you follow it up with Bobby Lashley defending against Kofi Kingston, the WWE Championship. I said there were only two finishes I wanted out of this match. One is that Bobby Lashley obliterates, dominates, and destroys Kofi Kingston. Or B, Xavier Woods comes out and fucks over Kofi Kingston. I knew the second one was incredibly unlikely, but the first one is the one we absolutely needed. And this, this was exactly the hell what it should have been. Not every match needs to be a 50-50 competitive battle. That's something that professional wrestling as a business as a whole needs to fucking learn from and understand. This should not have been a competitive back and forth 50-50 match. Bobby Lashley's supposed to be dominant. Bobby Lashley's supposed to be pissed. Bobby Lashley's supposed to be a monster. And you made him all of that and more in this match. He didn't need to go 20 or 30 minutes. Get in and out in 10 or less. And you got the job done. So like right here in the middle, you had some good, but then you had another shit show, which was Charlotte versus Rhea for the freaking Raw Women's Championship. And I know the Meltzer move marks are going to sit there and say, oh man, the crowd popped at the end. That match was really good. It was clunky, botchy, typical Charlotte Flair bullshit. It was bad enough you go into this match, you're like, there's nobody you connected with. There's nobody to like. You had the fans chanting early on in the match and throughout the first half plus of the match, we want Becky. That's not good. To the point where Charlotte Flair wins, LOL, Charlotte wins, big fucking surprise. What the hell did you need to do that for? And then you sit there and the crowd's popping and say, well, the match did his job or this match was really good. No, it fucking wasn't. And why the hell would the fans want to cheer Charlotte? I mean... It's Fort Worth, Texas, so it's a bunch of cowboy fans. So what else would you expect out of those caliber of morons? But golly, this match fucking sucked. I, I Wrestling fans can like whoever they like. Wrestling fans that think Charlotte Flair is good and not overrated, overpushed horse shit need to have their heads examined. She sucks. And this did nothing for Rhea Ripley... It's just fucking dumb, period. And the match just wouldn't end. Oh, it ended up near fall. The full finish, that makes it great. No, it's freaking stupid. Stop it. Have some damn standards. But thankfully, that was the last of the shit on this show. Well, I bet. You might be saying to yourself, Is Jeff become Max Headroom? Is Jeff having one of his direct fits? No. He's just mimicking the experience of Peacock, P E E C O C K TV, and the fact that they were glitching like a bitch right before leading up to and the start of the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Like, it was astounding that WWE was going to continue to plow ahead, even with the issues where this is a big featured match, and a lot of your fans aren't able to experience it. It's Peacock, P-E-E-C-O-C-K. Yes, we're that childish, because you swear to freaking God that some child has to be running Peacock TV. It seems like it's an issue every damn time. The service sucks. There's no excuse there's no apologies. There's no justification or rationale. Your shit sucks. Of course, it's in the Comcast family. Of course, it fucking sucks. Fix it. There is nothing else to say. Fix it. This is pathetic. Thankfully, though, the issues got resolved. And we were able to witness an outstanding men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Everything that the women's match wasn't. The men's match absolutely, positively was. So many of the spots were well-coordinated. Like, even the one spot where Riddle pushes freaking Ricochet off the ladder and Ricochet lands on his feet on the rope and then 
He sits there and does the flip out onto everybody. Usually I hate those fucking spots. I'm like, what's the fucking point of that? You're just trying to pop the crowd instead of trying to win the match. You know, it looks so damn good though. Who cares? Like this thing was brutal. It was intense. Most everybody got some decent shine, got in some key spots. Like this was really well done. And then of course the big moment, Big E climbing the ladder and retrieving the money in the bank briefcase. Man, that was a moment, a big moment. And it felt good to see it, absolutely did. And you might be wondering, man, you've been talking about Big E becoming a main eventer for a long time. Why aren't you more geeked up about this? I thought you would have been. You know, I thought I would have been too. Like, I'm happy about it, but I wanna see this character take a little bit more of a serious turn before we start really putting him in there in that main event spot. Now the question comes, what are you gonna do with Big E? And, you know, to me, the first answer would be, well, fucking, I want this guy to call his shot, cash in clean on Bobby Lashley at SummerSlam. You know, like the hell with the Oldberg stuff, the Goldberg stuff, but they're probably going to do Goldberg and Lashley at SummerSlam, so whatever. But I would certainly like to see them go down that route where you don't have Big E have to be the one that cashes in in questionable circumstances or takes advantage. Like, have him cash in legitimately, like, make him cool. Make him say, you know what? I have enough confidence in my abilities. I'm going to do this right. I want you to know what's coming. I'm challenging you to a match, Bobby Lashley, for the world title at this time at this show. We get that so infrequently that this would work massively well for the Big E character. The other option you have is you take the next eight, nine months and you build him up and you tweak the character a little bit, assuming that he's open to it and he should be, he needs to be. Um, and you could get to the point where you do some type of six man tag at WrestleMania that main events one of the nights where it's the Samoan dynasty, it's Roman and the Usos taking on the New Day. You know, think about that. If you don't have Big E try to cash in clean on Lashley trying to get revenge for what Lashley did to Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston, which is the obvious story, then you go the other route and you eventually get to this point where it's a six-man tag, winner takes all. And you can do that and you say, well, what about The Rock? What about him? You can always find an excuse to do that. Or in the meantime, you just wait and see how things play out and see what happens. Either way, like it's time for Big E to get a shot. I absolutely agree. I think the character still needs a little work, but it, it's time because if he didn't do it now, like it could be potentially too late. And speaking of too late, usually a lot of us would sit there and say, especially old men like me, be like, well, I hurry up and get this it's too long. I'm going to be done before 11 p.m. Eastern. We didn't say that tonight. It's amazing when you have two wrestlers, two characters that you are emotionally invested in, in a story that you're emotionally invested in, the WrestleMania main event that should have been, but fucking wasn't, that you get here. It's amazing how you're not concerned about the time or how long the match takes or anything like that. Like, this match went over a half hour, but goddamn, how nice was it, huh? To sit there and tune in to a main event of a pay-per-view and get two main event caliber performers in Edge and Roman Reigns in a main event of a pay-per-view. What a novel freaking concept. And to, again, the melts or move marks, this was working. Not the flippy bumpy shit. That's doing moves. This is working. Actually working the crowd. Getting them bought in. Getting them hooked. Getting them emotionally invested. To where they're making noise and popping for relatively basic fundamental elementary stuff. When you do that, you know you've really got them eating out of the palm of your hands. But wait, there's more. Not only was there lots of storytelling here, they even did some of the shenanigans and bullshit and interference off the ref bump. And that made sense. Like you got the ref bump and then out come Jimmy and Jay only to have the Mysterios come out and stop them to have Seth Rollins get involved once. That not fully work. Then to circle back and have Seth Rollins interfere a second time, cost edge the match, have our tribal chief reign supreme. Not that he needed the help or anything, but goddamn. 
Like, I can't wait to see how Meltzer only rates this as a four-star match. Because he's a fucking biased cuck moron for AEW in New Japan, period. But this was fantastic. And as the edge, Seth Rollins beat down and fight and scrap goes on and they kind of exit stage right, there's Roman Reigns and he's asking for a microphone. And so at that moment, the light bulb goes off to me. It's like, this is when they need to bring out John Cena. Like, you know it's coming. You don't know if it's here, if it's on SmackDown. And you might say, well, why didn't you wait until SmackDown? No. You do it here and you do it now because that way you can spend the next five days promoting John Cena's appearance for SmackDown. That's how business should be done. You're also telling fans like, hey, you need to watch these special events, these pay-per-views because you never know what's going to happen. And if you missed out, shame on fucking you. Because as much as I hate and detest Cena, as much as I think he's overrated and all this other shit, there is no denying that this is the match that I wanted for SummerSlam. There is no denying to me that this is what we need. This is what we want to see. There is no denying to me that when Cena's music hit, after Roman Reigns asked for everybody to acknowledge him, that was a big fucking moment. That was a huge ass deal. And that Fort Worth crowd responded in a massive way. Like the last hour plus of this pay-per-view was fantastic. And that's a frustration with the WWE sometimes is that they're capable of doing this. Putting on great storytelling matches that have layers and dynamics. Creating real, memorable, tangible moments that leave you wanting to know what's going to happen next. Craving that next piece. They can do this. And for some reason, they just so often fail to do so. But my God, when they do, it's special. And the ending of this, this main event, and all that went into it was fantastic. Fantastic. Edge versus Roman on its own. It's nice not to have the meddling of a midget. Just to have those guys one-on-one, -on -one, that should have been the Mania main event. But we got it here tonight instead. And then all the other stuff, you've obviously launched Seth Rollins and Edge onto their own thing, which can be an interesting story. But most importantly of all, you've got your SummerSlam main event. It's John Cena versus Roman Reigns for the Universal title. Fast and Furious star versus Fast and Furious star. Breakfast Club business in 2021. Still main eventing SummerSlam, bitches. That's fantastic. I love it and I'm here for it. And Cena, as much as you want to say, you can't see me, you can't see me. You won't be saying that shit after SummerSlam when Roman whoops that ass back to Hollywood and you have to acknowledge him as the one true tribal chief. Yeah. But anyways. I don't want to sit there and say with the spectacular finish to this show that this entire show was great. It wasn't. Like, we should be able to have enough context and the ability to differentiate, like, there were really good things and really dumb, stupid crap things on the show. Both can be true and it'd still be a good show. And it absolutely was a good show. It could have been much better. But man, at least if nothing else, it gave you a pretty damn satisfying finish as far as I'm concerned. But anyways, you let me know what you thought about Money in the Bank. Are there some of you that actually think that John Cena is going to beat Roman Reigns at SummerSlam? What would you do with Big E? How would you book him the next week, month, three months, six months? How would you have him try to cash in Money in the Bank? Who would you have him try to cash in against? Lots of things that we can talk about coming out of this pay-per-view. So let's talk about them in the comments. But anyways, I'm the Schleg Daddy, and this is OTR Essential. A friendly reminder, this is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'm out.